Hi, guys. Um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I met you a couple of years ago at Orfield Laboratories in Minneapolis, where they had the press day for a quiet place because they have yeah. the quietest room in the world there. Oh, uh, right. The anechoic right. chambers. That's right. <laughs> we had a great day there. Me that too. And I mean, a lot has happened in the last couple of years, including the fact that you were both nominated for an Oscar for the first film. Um, congratulations on that. And I wanted to know how special was that nomination for you? Because your, your work on that first film was so unique. Yeah, it was it was very special, um, you know, to to have it recognized because we were super proud of the movie and and super proud of the work that we did in the movie. We felt like you know, the, the work that we did, we really felt um, had probably as big an impact um, on the film as, as, you know, as the work we've done in, in any number of films. So we're just incredibly proud of the work and, and super happy that it, was, that it was recognized. I wanted to ask you, did you get a chance to go into that quiet, quiet room? And what was that experience like for you? Uh, yes, um, we both went into the Anacoke Chambers, um, and uh, the experience is uh, very unsettling because you're so used to have, being immersed in sound um, just in daily life, and uh, and when you have that pulled away from you, when you're in a totally, absolutely quiet environment, uh, it's not just unsettling, you actually start to lose your balance because we forget we rely on our ears for balance. Um, after a few minutes, your brain kind of readjusts to the low sound levels and you start to hear your heart beating, your blood going through your veins, fluids in your body. You can actually hear um, the sort of ringing of your nervous system. Um, it's a really strange experience. And Ethan and I had been in Anacoke Chambers um, before that visit to Minneapolis. And we actually used that experience um, to, uh, as inspiration to create the sound of Regan, the um, daughter uh, who is deaf. Um, when we go into her sonic points of view, we kind of used our own personal experiences with the Anacoke Chambers to create that internal sound uh, in, in her points of view. It's funny that you mentioned that because when you said unsettling, I thought of that, that scene in the film where the creatures first appear in the flashback and all of a sudden all the sound cuts out. And I realized that we're hearing it from Reagan's point of view and it was very unsettling. I mean, it was almost jarring. And I was wondering who, who came up with the idea to do that? I, I know it happened in the first film as well in, in a few scenes, but in this one, it was especially noticeable. Yeah, well, in, in this film, um, you know, one of the things that was different about, about um, this film than the, than the first film is that some of these moments where um, we take the audience into Regan's sonic POV, what John liked to call her sonic envelope, um, some of these moments John actually wrote into the script. And so there was a bit of a roadmap for where we were going to, flip the soundtrack and take all the sound out or else go to the sound of just this sort of low, you know, rumble of, of her blood flow and her nervous system pulsing. Um, so yeah, I, you know, in this film really John sort of mapped out a lot of, a lot of areas where he wanted to, to flip it like that. And what's so fun about doing that is it's actually the absence of sound that is really, truly unsettling. You know, you think of a lot of scary movie tropes and the things are loud, but the inverse is actually way more effective in creating tension and fear. Um, so, you know, we, we, we took a, a scene in the movie that um, to complete digital silence uh, for a big stretch longer than we did in, in part one and that's one of the most unsettling emotional moments of the entire film for me, because it is so different. Like we never really get the chance to do that in cinema. And, uh, and, it, and it kind of feels like pulling the rug out from underneath an audience when you do that. There's something amazing about it, so. It really did, it really had an effect on me. Now for the last film, you said that when you, when you provide the sound for a film, it's actually easier than providing a quiet uh, 
atmosphere for a film. I'm wondering how did that change with the second film? Because we do get a lot more sound. I mean, it's there's still many, many places where it's very quiet, but we have the opening scene with the flashback and then the family ventures out and they encounter different sounds. How did working on the second film change for you from the first film? Well, like you've just mentioned, there was definitely a lot more action in the second film. Um, and for us, it was about how do we make this, you know, uh, just a visceral experience. And because like with the, the first film, with this film, we wanted the audience to feel as, they're, as if they're in the middle of the scene. And so, you know, for the whole opening um, scene, the, the flashback scene, of the of the of the movie where the, the aliens first arrive on on Earth, these creatures, um, we wanted the audience to feel like they're experiencing this along with all the people in the town. And so that's about, you know, making the action super visceral and super real and um, and actually not playing any music. So um, that it it feels, you know, like you're in the middle of it. And, you know, the other interesting thing that it does is that when we cut into Regan's POV of total silence, it's this dramatic contrast that that provides a lot of energy and a lot of propulsion to the to the cut because it's such a dramatic um, shift in consciousness. When you have to provide a sound for a film and it's like a sound that you've never had before. Like, I mean, the aliens, their sounds. Uh, where do you go to get that kind of a sound? Do you, do you have a library or something or do you, how do you create them? Well, you know, our, what we're really um, passionate about is creating uh, things from scratch and not relying on libraries at all, um, if possible. Um, and so part of that process is First, we have to kind of like brainstorm and think like, okay, what, what were what these creatures sound like and why? So we kind of reverse engineer it in a way. First, we start with, okay, well, they're essentially blind. They have hyperacute hearing, which they use to navigate, you know, the world. So what um, analogs are there in the, in the natural world to, to something like that? And so ideas come up like, well, bats a very poor vision, but really acute hearing. And they use echolocation, they'll put a chirp out, which then reflects. So we thought, okay, bats and clicking, you know, chirping, dolphins use echolocation. They have little clickings that they use to create three-dimensional sonic space that they visualize the world through. So we started thinking, okay, well, clicking, let's start explore that. What things click? And we tried, um, you know, thousands of different ideas and, uh, and then they kind of just one day randomly uh, occurred to us and our team that, well, we have this stun gun at the shop and in the kitchen, we had a bowl of grapes and put the stun gun against the grape to create this very fast clicking that, okay, this might be interesting and then slowed that down. And that is the sound of the creature's echolocation. So I think the process is very much um, experimental. We try different things and, and, and we keep trying until we give ourselves goosebumps and then we know we're on the right track. And finally, what's the most difficult sound you've ever had to come up with for a movie? <laughs> oh, that is a tough one. Um, you know, um, I'm honestly gonna say, um, you know, and it's gonna sound completely counterintuitive, but, but really, um, the idea of going into Regan's um, POV um, in these in these movies in this series, uh, which involves taking sound out, is actually um, probably one of the most difficult things to do for us as sound designers because what we're expected to do um, always, you know, on a daily basis, is to put sounds in, and so to basically be able to convince people to let us take all the sound out um, to the point where we have, you know, digital zero, no sound at all. It actually, um, it takes a lot of bravery on the part of the filmmaker really to let us, to let us play with that. And, um, 
And it seems like it would be the easiest thing to do to actually have no sound. But in a strange way, that's actually probably one of the most difficult things that we've ever, you know, had to do. That's surprising. That's totally not what I thought you'd say. Yeah. I don't know, Eric, maybe you've you've got another. Well, answer. you know, um, there's there's a lot of different sounds that have been really, really challenging over, you know, we do such a range of projects from hyper realistic to totally unrealistic and everything in between. Um, you know, the film Argo was a big challenge to create really realistic chants that sound like it's thousands and thousands of people chanting in Farsi and having it be totally realistic and accurate and the proper dialect of Farsi. Um, that's really challenging. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, I think it took, uh, it was about two years of development to create the new Godzilla roar for Gareth Edwards film Godzilla. And, you know, not based on any living creature on earth, you know, something that's totally constructed, um, you know, and, and, but that's one of my favorite things about sound and <clears throat> completely applies to A Quiet Place part one and part two is that sound is half the experience. Sound is a very abstract kind of art. We can take a sound that has nothing to do with what's happening on picture, but make it work. And it has this alchemy with what you hear and what you see that, um, that is part of the magic of cinema for me. So um, it's, it's been a dream to work with Ethan and John Krasinski on both of these films, because as a, for a sound designer, it's just a playground. Thank you both so much, not just for your work on this film, but for talking with me today. It's been so nice to chat with you again and keep up the good work. Thank Thanks you so much. much. It's wonderful to talk with you. You too.